As you learned in earlier lessons, the definition of a market is a place where buyers and sellers meet. In every market, there is a demand for the good, service, or resource in question, and there is a supply of the good, service, or resource in question. The purpose of this lesson is to define supply, define the law of supply, introduce the concepts of the supply schedule and the supply curve, and distinguish between changes in the quantity supplied versus the changes in supply by focusing on the different determinants of supply for a particular good, service, or resource. The definition of supply is quite similar to that of demand, except in this case we're talking about the provision of goods and services rather than the willingness and ability of consumers to buy the goods. Supply is defined as a schedule or a curve showing the quantities of a particular good, service, or resource that suppliers are willing and able to provide at a range of prices in a particular period of time. With this definition, we can now move on to what we call the law of supply. Since the supply curve or supply schedule, e.g. the table, shows the relationship between the quantities that businesses are willing to provide the market and the prices, we must come up with some relationship between price and quantity that applies to supply of all different goods and services. That relationship is described in the law of supply. The law of supply says simply that there exists a direct relationship between the price of a particular good or service and the quantity that businesses are willing and able to supply. In fact, we're missing one important part to this definition. The law of supply assumes that all else is held constant when the price changes. So we must add the Latin expression ceteris paribus to the beginning of our definition of the law of supply. So assuming all else stays the same, no other variables are changing in a market, a change in the price alone will lead to a corresponding increase or decrease in the quantity of a good or service that businesses are willing and able to supply. Let's now move over to our supply schedule and we'll come up with a hypothetical series of prices and talk about the possible corresponding quantities that businesses would be willing and able to supply at each of those prices. We're talking about energy drinks here, so let's think about a drink like Red Bull or Monster and talk about the possible price ranges that those energy drinks might sell for. And we'll start at a low price of 0 0.5. Let's assume we're talking about dollars here, so that's 50 cents, half of a dollar. Let's go up in 50 cent increments to $5. We now have a range of possible prices from 50 cents to $5 per energy drink. Assume now that there are many different producers of energy drinks, not just Red Bull and Monster, but dozens of others that can produce energy drinks at the different prices available. What is a logical relationship between the price and the quantity supplied of energy drinks? We need a value here, so let's say that the values in the column on the right here are in thousands. Let's assume that at 50 cents, only 1,000 energy drinks will be provided to the market, but as the price goes up, the quantity supplied goes up. At $1, 2,000 will be provided, at 150, 3,000, and so on. As our table shows, as the price of energy drinks rises, the quantity that businesses are willing and able to supply will increase. This relationship represents an illustration of the law of supply. We can now create a supply curve from our supply schedule here on the left. Let's now plot the price of energy drinks against the quantity supplied. We'll put some of the prices from our table onto our supply graph. We've put the prices on the vertical axis as we do in economics. Now let's put some quantities on the horizontal axis. All we have to do to plot our supply curve, therefore, is put the points from our supply schedule onto the graph. We'll put a few of those points on this graph now. At a price of 50 cents, 1,000 energy drinks would be supplied. At a price of $2, 4,000 would be supplied. And at a price of $4, 8,000 would be supplied. As you can see, these three points give us what we call our supply curve, which in this case is a linear supply curve 
showing the direct relationship between the price of energy drinks and the quantity that businesses are willing and able to supply. Let's look at the next learning objective on the left here. We now want to distinguish between changes in quantity supplied versus changes in supply. One of the common mistakes that econ students make is confusing the concepts of supply and demand with quantity supplied and quantity demanded. A common misconception would be the statement that an increase in the price of energy drinks leads to an increase in the supply of energy drinks. This is incorrect use of the terminology from economics. In fact, an increase in price leads to an increase in quantity supplied. Graphically, this can be shown as a movement along the supply curve. As we can see, as the price of energy drinks increases from $1.50, where the quantity to quantity supplied is 3000 to $2, the quantity supplied increases. A change in quantity supplied refers to a movement from one point, we'll call this point A, to point B along a supply curve. As we're going to see in a moment, this is distinct from a change in the supply of energy drinks. So what does a change in supply refer to then? A change in supply occurs when the entire supply of a good shifts either inwards or outwards. We're going to talk in a moment about the things that can cause a shift in a supply curve, but let's first explain on the left here what is meant by a change in supply. An inward shift of the supply curve corresponds with what we call a decrease in supply, while an outward shift in the supply curve corresponds with an increase in supply. We can show what shifts in the supply curve look like by illustrating such shifts on the graph. A shift to the left, as I'm doing here, from S to S1, represents a decrease in supply. What this means is that at every price, now a smaller quantity of energy drinks will be supplied. Instead of 4,000 drinks being supplied at a price of $2, now only 2,000 drinks will be supplied. And instead of 2,000 drinks being supplied at a price of $1.50, only 1,000 drinks will be supplied. The quantity supplied has decreased at every price following a decrease in supply. An increase in supply is illustrated as an outward shift in a supply curve from S to S2. And unsurprisingly, an increase in supply implies that at every price, now a greater quantity of energy drinks would be supplied than previously. Instead of 3,000 energy drinks being supplied at a price of 150, now 5,000 drinks are supplied. And instead of 4,000 drinks being supplied at a price of $2, now 6,000 energy drinks are supplied. An increase in supply occurs when the supply curve shifts to the right. A decrease in supply occurs when the supply curve shifts to the left. So the last thing we're going to talk about in this video is the factors that can cause an increase or a decrease in the supply of a good. Clearly, this is not the result of a change in price because, as I explained earlier, a price change leads to a movement along a supply curve, for example, from A to B or from B to A. A shift in the supply curve is the result of something other than a change in the price. We refer to the factors that can shift a supply curve as the non-price determinants of supply, or in some cases, the supply shifters. That is another term for the factors that can cause a shift in supply. I'm going to scroll down a little bit as we introduce the non-price determinants of supply. Over the years, I've learned that it helps to have pneumatic devices or acronyms to help you remember different concepts in economics. The acronym that I've used over the years to remember the determinants of supply is STORES, S-T-O-R-E-S. If you remember these six letters, then you will always remember the factors that can cause a shift in the supply of a particular good or service. The S stands for subsidies and taxes. In other words, government intervention. Subsidies and taxes are ways that governments can either increase or decrease the supply of particular goods. A subsidy is a payment from the government to producers for each unit that they produce. A subsidy essentially lowers the cost of production and therefore increases the supply of a good. A tax, everybody knows what taxes are, but the kind of taxes that affect supply of particular goods are known as excise taxes or indirect consumption taxes. 
these are taxes applied to the production of different goods which increase the cost of production and therefore lead to a decrease in the supply of the good. A tax on a particular good will decrease that good supply in the market and lead to a smaller quantity being supplied at every price. The T in our acronym stands for technology. Technology is any machinery or capital goods that are employed by the producer of a good towards the production of the good. New technology is obviously going to lead to an increase in the supply of a good because de generally speaking, newer technologies are more efficient and productive than older technologies. Okay. Let's move on to the O. In this acronym, O stands for the same thing that it does in the acronym I use in my determinants of demand, which is other related goods prices. In this case, however, other related goods do not refer to substitutes and complements in consumption, rather other goods that a firm could produce instead of the good in question. It, help, it may help to use an example here. If a factory is currently manufacturing footballs, but there's an increase in the price of rugby balls, there's nothing stopping that factory from using the capital and the resources that it currently employs to make footballs and, and manufacture rugby balls instead. Therefore, it's possible that an increase in the price for rugby balls can lead to a decrease in the supply of footballs as the factory will switch to rugby balls instead of footballs since there are more profits to be made. This would be shown as a decrease in the supply of footballs. The fourth determinant of supply is resource costs. As the costs of the resources needed to produce a particular good rise, the supply of that good will decrease. And as the costs of resources needed to produce a good fall, the supply of that good will increase. The resources we're referring to here are land, labor, and capital. An example of this is falling wages should increase supply of manufactured goods. Since it becomes cheaper to produce those goods once the wages that firms have to pay their employees have decreased. The next letter in our determinants of supply is E. The E stands for expectations, kind of like it does in our determinants of demand. However, in this case, we're talking about the expectations of producers of future prices. To illustrate this, I can explain how a company like Red Bull might respond to the expectation that demand for their energy drinks will increase in the future. If any producer expects demand to rise in the future, they can expect price increases in the future. This expectation of future price increases should incentivize the firm to increase its production today so that it can meet the rising demand tomorrow. The final non-price determinant of supply that can lead to a shift in the supply of a particular good is a very simple one, and it's simply the size of the market. In this case, we're referring to the number of firms producing a particular good or service. Not surprisingly, an increase in the number of firms pr producing a particular good should cause the supply of that good to increase, whereas a decrease in the number of firms producing a good should cause the supply of that good to decrease. In this video, we have introduced the concept of supply. We have defined supply as a schedule or a curve showing the relationship between the quantity of a particular good or service that firms are willing and able to supply and the price. The law of supply was defined as ceteris paribus. There is a direct relationship between the price of good or service and the quantity supplied. We've distinguished between changes in quantity supplied versus changes in supply by showing how a change in the price of a good causes a movement along an existing supply curve and a change in the quantity supplied, whereas a change in one of the determinants of supply causes a shift in the supply curve either inwards, showing a decrease, or outwards, showing an increase. Finally, we've concluded by introducing the non-price determinants of supply for which I taught you a useful acronym for remembering them, that is STORES, S-T-O-R-E-S, subsidies, taxes, technology, other related goods prices, resource costs, the expectations of producers of future prices, and the size of the market, referring to the number of firms producing a good.